we've um, you know referenced Star Baby before in terms of of his um, des- descriptions of you know going out and shooting harms and that kind of stuff. And one of the things that he said was, which was really interesting, was that the Brits would never say anything about alarm, wouldn't, wouldn't tell anybody anything about it. So he, he had no. He, I said to him, "How did it work? I have no idea how it works. They never told us anything." So. So, you know, the, the system's out of use, but obviously there are some, some things you're not going to talk about. But what can you tell us about it? What can you tell us about the mission? What can you tell us about, you know, what CAD meant or SEED meant to you as a Royal Air Force sure. tornado pilot? Yeah, so when I came back to to 9 Squad, and it was really 9 and 31, there were the um, the SEED um, role specialists. And when I say role specialists, it, it didn't take up a massive amount of the flying, I would say maybe 25%. That's a rough, a rough percentage. So if you were to compare us to, you know, a block 50 CJ squadron doing, you know, the, um, the force protection mission that they've got, I think they spend a lot more time training to it than, than we did with the, um, with the alarm. Um, I guess, you know, to, to kind of reference a little bit of history, the, and this is where I can show you a, um, a bit of, um, showing the screen here. So I'll show you, uh, a picture of a, a tornado GO one actually from the um, from the Cold War. This is when the aircraft first came into um, into service. So forgive me while I just bring up the slideshow. The requirement for uh, alarm came out really during the Cold War, and it took some time for the missile to be developed. From what I understand, in open source materials, it was to do with the um, the rocket motor. Um, they had trouble with getting it to work in the way that they wanted it to. In essence, you, what you see here is a couple of GR1s from 31 Squadron. They were based at Bruggen. And um, the the fit that you've got there is one that really would limit the range of the aircraft. But the the missile was really designed to punch a hole in the flock where all the uh, mobile SAMs would have been to allow follow-on strikers to go through through that hole and um, and then prosecute their mission. So obviously, it, there's the debate about suppression versus destruction of enemy air defences. But one of the capabilities of the missile was was called corridor su- suppression. So you could fire off a salvo of the um, of the missiles, and they would seek out targets in um, in priority order and start to engage those. And and that would work really well for a low level ingress for for a strike package. I think the thing to highlight is that the GR1 was not really capable of um, of smart weapons handling. It didn't have any interface between the aircraft and the missile. So the crews would have done their mission planning and then um, put the mission data onto uh, onto a media that was then transferred to a, uh, a piece of equipment that run by the engineers called PUGS, which I think stood for programmable uh, upload ground station or something like that. But think of a box that they would plug into each mission and, and um, upload the the uh, mission files detailing the, the target's um, location and um, and the priorities, which system they're looking at, all the uh, electronic uh, warfare library stuff you know, that you've heard generically talked about by Star Baby. But once it was uploaded to the uh, to the aircraft, then there was no interface um, capable with the missile on the GR1 because it had no data bus. So, you know, the sort of endurance the aircraft would have on a, um, a low level mission would be probably 40 minutes, 45 minutes that the fit would have around five tons worth of, uh, of fuel. So this kind of mission would be get airborne out of Bruggen, volley off the missiles for the for the first push through the uh, through the flot and then return. Uh, and um, the corridor suppression mode that was was talked about never really was used um, or to even talked about or trained to after after the um, the Cold War finished and, and we transitioned to the GR4, which is where I joined the role. So uh, when I arrived on Nine Squadron, then it was a it was a role generally that um, took part in, a, in, a, in exercises. We do a workup for people. It was a role specialization along with um, some of the other smarter weapons like brimstone, as we'll come on to. But um, in essence, I w- well, I would summarise by saying it was not that easy to uh, to plan and not that easy to operate. Uh, very mandrolic overall. Best suited to targets of known location, and um, the aircraft has no emitter location system. So all the great stuff that Star Baby was talking about in terms of range quality and and stuff like that, we would have relied on a good in picture beforehand to make the best plan we could. And then an airborne update from um, an EW asset like the um, Nimrod R1 or or the um, or the River Joint. 
so that that would have been passed over the radio and of course you know there there are limitations to how you would do how you can do that you might talk about a certain system as fragged so that this location was unchanged or it might be placed or, or describe reference bullseye hmm. but um you can appreciate that you know any changes would be potentially quite tricky to um to react to effectively i think probably the best thing to do is to explain generically how we might how we might um plan a mission and then explain why why it was difficult to adjust to the changes. We talked about the pugs. Now, when I came to the GR4, that had been superseded by PC pugs. So effectively, the um, modeling of the missile, the seeker, all that stuff was on, on a laptop, a secret laptop. So in terms of prosecuting attack, we decide, OK, uh, what is the threat system? and Without going into too much detail, the PC pugs allow us to choose ranges that uh, achieve the probability of kill that we were looking for. There was some planning in parallel with the regular Tampa, which is um, a bit like Falcon Falcon View, the mission planning aid that you would plan the rest of your mission with, and you would eventually incorporate or export the mission from PC Pugs to um, to the Tampa. But at the initial stage, you would be coming up with a plan that, yeah, we need to come in from that direction because it gives us some um, terrain screening. And then you'd try to work out the range you wanted to fire from, given the effective effect you were looking to achieve. And that would effectively come up with a an iron bomb fire point. So think of it as a a place from which the missile, if it lost any um, connection with the main computer and the aircraft through the data bus, it would go, OK, well, you've got me to this place and I know where the where the target is from here. Um, if you have the data bus link working, then potentially you could manipulate it and, and take the aircraft and the missile somewhere else. But this iron bomb fire point was like a like a reversionary means of delivering the weapon if, if the ROE allowed it. Um, so, you know, in terms of planning the launch point, there were different modes we, we could use. Now, we've talked about corridor suppression. That, that had become a moot point by that stage. The, the main modes that we could use were direct, which is like effectively like the, the harm, where it would tra trajectory shape based on the range of the firing. Um, and, and as Darby Abbey said in the past, that these, these shots are going to be slower than a SAM. So any shots you take are shots of retribution. If, if you're being shot at yourself. Um, so the, the director is the first one. Loiter is the unusual capability that the um, that the alarm had. Uh, and dual is a compromise between the both, neither the best bits of either. But um, loiter is an interesting one because effectively the aircraft, having delivered the missile, the missile would climb to height and then deploy a parachute. And then the uh, missile would be over the top of the um, target set waiting for the threat system to be uh, detected and at, at some stage it could if it got the criteria then detach the parachute and then the weapon would free fall so that's quite unusual so i think honestly the main strength of alarm is that the the enemy is like at the time uh, the threat notions were likely to be familiar with with harm but the the unusual thing about alarm is this loiter capability so they think okay well i did my procedural switch off of um, of the radar transmitter and the the launch aircraft's gone away i'm good but you're not potentially because this missile's in the parachute then it drops the parachute and then and free falls to um to detonate around the um threat radar and, and may achieve some damage or a kill the challenge if you can imagine um loiter is the wind effect um and of course, you know, as has been alluded to by the Star Baby and others, that you know, your, your threat system, if you are engaging a battery, is not just a thing, a single um, launcher, it's or a single radar. It might be one radar, or it might be like a battery of SA. It might have multiple um, telars there. So, how do you position this missile in its parachute so that it, the seeker is going to see what it needs to see? So, think of a torch dangling under a parachute that's descending. The, what a torch beam that's diverging slightly and the footprint it has on the ground is kind of analogous to what the 
the seeker can see and what the missile could reach kinematically. So the lower you can imagine if it's in its parachute, the higher it's, it drops the parachute, the greater capability it's got to manoeuvre whilst free falling and gliding to, to engage the target. Um, it's the wind could be a major limiting factor. So yeah, we could adjust a bit for that. Mm. But as the weapon uh, drops, the footprint of the torch beam on the ground gets smaller, the basket that it can engage gets smaller. It's massively, massively complex. So the people who were most knowledgeable about the system generally had done a lot of work talking to industry and, uh, you know, say M MBDA, who are the manufacturers, were excellent, um, always on hand to answer questions. And we, I think we really did need them. I wouldn't account myself as an expert in alarm. I know a couple of characters who were really good and who, who um, in, were involved in the second Gulf War. But I, I think honestly, I would be minded if it was my plan, I would be saying right to my contact at MBDA, this is the effect I'm looking to have. This is the disposition we've got. How are we going to achieve that? What settings do we need? It was that complex in terms of priorities and stuff like that to um, you know, build the ULIB that, uh, along the same lines that Starby always said with the, the parametrics in there, but then which elements of the system do you select, which you want it, the missile to look out for, and um, and how do you prioritise those? So I just felt it was really, really complex um, to do, do a, an effective plan. At, the, at a simple level, and this is one of the benefits of the system, you could self-suppress a target. So, uh, and the, this is a... Um, kind of the limited combat ready level of training that all the squadrons did. You could put, um, as we had in the picture, but on the picture behind me, you've got an outboard stub pylon with, um, it's above the fuel tank. You could put your um, your alarm there. You could have your self-protection missiles, be it ASRAM or A9 Lima on the inboards and your regular bomb load underneath the jet. So you could fire, you could ingress the target area, you could fire your alarms then uh, arc around the outs outskirts of the target area, waiting for the alarms to get to the, the impact point or to be established in the parachutes before you then turn in to deliver your own weapons. So, you know, effectively, you were able to self-suppress to, a, to a, a degree. And I think that was a major strong point. Most people could do that kind of plan. But the seed where you're offering support to a package with the um, the changing locations of the target and try to uh, make make sure that you've got enough weapons over the target to provide the coverage during the TOT window of the strikers becomes very complicated. But the strong points of the of the aircraft is that we had two sets of um, brains. Um, you know, I can be flying the aircraft, missing the ground. Um, and staying out, out of a missile engagement zone whilst the backseater is probably heads in a fair bit, um, manipulating the mission data um, to reflect a change in target location. Um, and, it, and it is literally typing in lats and longs. So you can see that there's room for like um, transcription errors. And, and so how how do you translate your um, your update from uh, the, the RJ, from the river joint, you know, where, where the target where the threat system is now moved to, then how do you, that might be described in, as, as a bullseye position. You know, you've got to then translate that into a Latin long and make sure you key it in correctly. So you can appreciate there's, there's a lot of complexity involved there. Um, I would say also that um, trying to get, even with pre-planned attacks, we do an attack preview where, where you go, okay, we've got the, the data downloaded, the missile run a self test on it. Does it look what we're expecting? We are expecting to fire at the back end of the basket because you know the threat is potent and we need to be able to then hide behind a hill and egress. Does it look like that? Does the buy and bomb fire point, this, this reversionary fire point, the planned fire point, does it look where it should in, 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 com in comparison to the markers for the basket? And, and it was not unusual to find that something had gone wrong in the plan. And then you have to go back and review the tapes, review the plan and go, right, what what, what went wrong? And, um, and, and kind of uh, get to the bottom of that. And, you know, it wasn't unusual to need some uh, weapons instructor input to, um, to validate that. So it's by no means as easy to use as, uh, as I, I get the impression that harm was, especially with the HTS and the, the kind of the automation of it. 
Um, so I've talked about direct mode and loiter mode. Um, dual is effectively a hybrid of, of the two. Uh, think of a situation where you you fire the missile, it's heading towards the target. If it doesn't get the threat system emissions that it's looking for as its top priority, then it will then abort a direct attack and climb to height and deploy the parachute and then enter a loiter mode. So it's quite flexible, um, but you didn't get the same endurance in the parachute as a loiter. And, um, you know, perhaps if, if it was um, a later switch on from the... Uh, from the threat system, then maybe if you fired a direct mode, that you would um, you you would have the system come online and start transmitting towards the end of the time of flight to the extent that the missile would then home on the target. So it was kind of like a compromise um, compromise mode. So yeah, I think those are the kind of the main the main points. So I think as as um, it's been alluded to, people didn't really know what we could do with it. So I think first there's a surprise factor. Um, to the employment of the weapon and as, well, as far as i know it was used in it was definitely used in the first gulf war second gulf war not quite so many missiles alarmed to and again it's hard to validate was there a kill you know i understand some systems went offline but it's hard to um hard to quantify as to whether it was a hard kill or, or not and that actually brings me on to just one other thing to do with the loiter mode if you think about it the um the missiles landing on a parachute, it's undamaged, so there's the potential for exploitation. So that's that's something to consider as well, isn't it? And um, and and one thing that we talked about offline that I'd just like to highlight is the whole rules of engagement thing. I, I remember Star Baby being very um, eloquent with his description about how his equipment could come up with range quality figures, and um, and so you'd know where. The emitter was but one of the things that really struck me at the time with alarm was that is getting the rules of engagement and the permissions to use it because you might know where the threat system is relative to you but what's nearby have the enemy set their missiles up missile systems up close to a primary school yeah yeah it's in violation of the law of armed conflict but you know that never stopped anyone before um so you know i, I just felt it would need to be a full-on shooting war with the lawyers saying yeah just crack on do what you need to do um before we'd be allowed to employ it because if if you were to compare it with a, a standard uh, attack that we might have planned and, and the, uh, that we did plan the the lawyers got to enjoy having right what is the target construction where are you coming from what are the impact conditions what fragmentation is there going to be and what's the pattern of life like? You know, are there going to be people there at the time? Is it rush hour or is everyone in their bed when you're hitting this target? And then they can quite comfortably say the chances of killing non-competence is virtually nil. So, you know, that's with a, a normal bomb. Well, if you if you change to firing a, an anti-radiation missile, you don't know fully where it's going to go, especially if the target location has changed. What's in the, what's nearby? What if the, if the weapon malfunctions or if, if they switch off? And, and the the the, um, the missile loses guidance. So I don't have answers to these questions other than, you know, that the, there has to be appetite at the political level to shoulder this risk when you're employing weapons in this in this way. And you're not you don't have the luxury of controlling the parameters and being able to predict the weapons effects in the same way that you would for other pre-planned targeting that, that have gone on. How did you, Nick, um, how did you, if you're, I think, I can't remember how many were in the photo. It looked like the fit was seven. So was it four on the um, shoulder pylons and then three on the center pylons or whatever they're called? Yeah, the so the, 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 the under fuselage pylons we call the shoulder ones. So you could, you could put three underneath there and the stub pylons that were uh, off the sides of the, uh, the pylon holding the underwing tanks, you could fit them to either the outboard ones or the inboard or both but for, to have self-protection in the form of an air to air missile be it asram or an a9 lima you would if you're on a seed mission generally speaking be carrying five so three under the under the fuselage and then two on the stubs with your, your self-protection missiles intact but you, you know if you if you had fighter sweep where you decided that you needed that many missiles then clearly you could increase the loadout so, so how did you deconflict between the targets and what the missile was going to go after then? So I think, I mean, if you take the um, sort of hanging in the parachute mode 
as an example. You've got four, five, seven of these things hanging in, hanging in parachutes over a, a given um, area of terrain, and as you said, that sort of area shrinks as the as it as it sort of the height up of the ground decreases. But uh, you know, l- let's say you've got four emitters in the, in that area that you want to go after with those seven missiles. How do you make sure that the first emitter that comes online doesn't get all seven landing on on its head? A really good question. Yeah, I think it would be down to um, setting the priorities differently in each missile uh and this is where it became massively complicated because you would in the salvo you would have um effectively call, what do we call them sub targets so everything you could have a whole cluster of sub targets in the same area uh, and you could have fired the, the missiles targeting these different sub targets from the same iron bomb fire point the same reversionary fire point or planned fire point and and they would all be slightly different so that that was the would be the way that you would do it however you know the we had loser plans and any good um you know attack pilot and air defense pilot will have a, a solid loser plan what happens if we have fallout from a whole aircraft like number two doesn't go and if he was targeting a particular emitter then you have to go right what, what are my priorities and what was the pre-briefed um as or fallout from that how, how would we reallocate these um these emitters but you could also have problems with just individual missiles. And if you didn't have approval to fire in the degraded mode from the pre-planned fire point, then you would you would have to reduce the number of missiles that you would fire in the salvo. So, yeah, you, uh, even now I can just go, wow, yeah, that this would, was the sort of thing you had to try and um, take into account. But only by changing the priorities against that individual sub-target, could you change, could you stop missiles all going, biting off on the same emitter? And, and that's that's why it was really tough to uh, to to come up with the plan, even in when everything's working, let alone when when stuff starts falling over, you know, you get bad missiles or you get uh, an aircraft n- not make the push. So, and, and as somebody who's definitely not schooled in the art, uh, of electronic warfare um i'm thinking about the uh the pictures i see of of radar signals and i'm thinking about side lobes and that kind of thing and then i'm thinking about this thing in the parachute and it's directly above it so is it the side lobe that it's going to see it's not going to be the main beam of uh, um, a radar I, I, i'm sorry i can't answer that but you're, you're generally heading in the right sort of directions yeah okay okay all right fair sorry. enough um no that's fair enough that's fair enough so uh, and what um did the missile weigh then? I mean, it looks fairly sizable. I think uh, harm is like a thousand pounds, or it's a thousand pound yeah. class weapon. Is the same I, thing? I'm gonna, I'm, I haven't looked this up, and I'm sorry. I'm gonna go with something like four or five hundred kilos. So yeah, more than an air-to-air missile, not as much as a bomb. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be much more helpful than that. <laughs> I'd have to Google it just like you. Uh, and actually, there's not a lot of information out there now. Um, uh, you know, in, in preparation for this chat, I went onto the MVDA website. They don't declare it anymore. And, um, you know, you're just left with what you could find on Wikipedia. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's reasonably hefty as missiles go, like any air-to-ground missile. But, um, yeah, somewhere around, I'm going to go with somewhere like four or 500 kilos. Okay. You you previously described yourself, I think this is actually before we hit record, this is the first time we ever chatted, and you'd said, well, you know, I'm going to, I, I'm interested in coming on, and, and you know, but i got to be careful because all the QYs are going to say, what's, what's this... Uh, uh, Q, QFI doing talking about weaponeering and stuff. Yeah. So, so you have your your so your alibis there. But um, I just wondered then, from from an employment point of view, did you, if you think about the wild weasel mission as it is in the U.S. Air Force, U- United States Navy, you know the U.S. U.S. Armed Forces, um, and the schools and the level of, you know, sort of knowledge that's been built or was built over decades. Uh, and then you've got the RAF doing this for twenty five percent of the time. You were on nine squadron. Did you have to learn a lot about the threat? Did you did you do did you have did you invite guys to do exchange tours with you who were coming from weasel platforms in the US? What what sort of I mean, how much did you have to know about uh, we, about the weaseling mission? I do not think we, in all honesty, we were a patch on the CJs and. Um, so yeah sorry sorry guys i that's my honest opinion you know for my colleagues i don't want to sort of talk us down but i just think we didn't do it enough um we had good information you know as you would imagine any 
nation would have the best available information on threat systems and stuff like that. I just I don't think we trained often enough to it. Like when we if we had a build up and we did some exercises in Germany with um, with the Luftwaffe and their ECRs and stuff like that. It's like anything, the more you do it, the better you get. And I do understand the CJs do have to do, um, you know, some air to air stuff. It's part of their force protection role. So I guess they have to swing away from the pure harm bit. And, and you have to obviously come back to this stuff often enough. So, yeah, I don't think we did it enough. Um, in terms of exchanges, the exchange between the tornado forces are generic and um, the US armed forces generally was with the EA6. So it was more with the jamming side of things. And that's another interesting thing to say about the way the RAF structured its squadrons in terms of we had EWOs and EYs, but EYs were the, the kind of subject matter experts, but really think of them as being experts in the aircraft DAS. Um, so the, the jamming pods, the RHWR and things like that. And obviously, you know, when it came to running a plan, you'd certainly ask your EYs about to just kind of give, give us a brief key points about the threat that you were, um, whose mares you were planning to, uh, to penetrate. But when you, when you hear, when I heard the stories, you know, Star Babies, you, you were, um, EY training or um, electronic warfare officer training, it sounded in a much, much greater depth than than, than we did. And um, I think so that probably places the RAF's attempt at seed stroke deed in, in a proper context. I think I think perhaps we realised that we weren't in the same league as those guys and maybe as a result we're not going to brag um, and talk up our capability that perhaps we couldn't back up with, um, you know, with, and deliver on. But I think, you know, as I said, really, I think the, the main benefit, we could surprise the enemy and say, look, we can do this. And there were some systems we had a very good capability against. Um, and that would have been an unpleasant surprise to those operators uh, on the um, on the enemy side. But I think in that situation, recognize that, you know, talk to your CJ and your prowler guys, say, look, OK, this is how we can help. You know, do you want it? You know, we can offer that. And if nothing else, and in these modern well, modern days where you've got double digit SAMs, you're forcing them maybe to engage the, the missiles, the um, the alarm, rather than the strike package. You might be able to run them out of missiles for that um, or bring out other, other, some other novel capabilities to chip away at the SA doing something unusual, something different. Um, you know, I think it always would get SAM operators' attention if warheads are detonating uh, close by and they think, what the hell was that, you know? Um, so I think that that's really what what we had to offer. Maybe you've already answered this question when you talk about you know being able to self suppress. Um, you you mentioned the original uh, ambition behind Alarm being corridor su suppression during the Cold War, and, and I, I guess most people listening to this will be able to understand or imagine that scenario. So, what was the new imaginary um, sort of scenario then for Alarm? when you were there then, the, the, just the self-suppression? Or did, did you think, well, if there's a big ATO, we're definitely going to be called in on to go and hit some SAMs somewhere in the, in the theatre of operations? I think that the majority of it was likely to be self-suppression. The, the challenging thing with moving the target um, location was that we would superimpose the iron bomb, iron bomb fire point on the... Um, on the the uh, the sub target where the where the missile was located, so instead of having this conventional display, we would just fire off a range, and and um, and and that way you could move things around, and obviously that might compromise your ingress in terms of making the best uh, use of load of terrain and and um, radar shadow and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of threat systems, you know, generically it'd be like a single digit formal. Soviet Union stroke Warsaw Pact and and some of the export um, French systems stroke legacy American systems that have been um, you know exported around various parts of the world so um, that's the sort of stuff we were generally training to um, and I think yeah the self suppression stuff would be I think the main thing that we could offer to to the package and of course the other thing to you know you'd have to deconflict that with other operators and, you know, clear avenues of fire. Well, you need to make sure people aren't above you because the, the missile would climb to height. And, you know, you, you can't have that going through somebody's height block if they're in front of you. You'd want to make sure that you had a clear field of fire for that. Yeah. 
maybe, maybe again, this is another one you've already answered by absence of, of information rather than, than by things you have said. But harm is well known to have a, a um, harm a sensor mode where you can pull up what the seeker is seeing and use that to find and, and, and target sensors. It also has a target of opportunity mode and, and a self-protection mode. Did you have any of those sorts of capabilities? No, no. Um, really, it was a case of that we could uh, interface with the missile download the coordinates to it and check that that link was working but we didn't really get um, any indication of what the seek was seeing while the missile was still on the aircraft the back from what i can remember there was a, a button press that would happen about 15 seconds to launch which would trigger trigger the thermal battery in the um in the missile itself and that was the first time then then the rest of the missile was being powered so the the power that it got from the aircraft wasn't for the whole missile at that point, as, as I can recall anyway. So no, we didn't didn't have any of those any of those things. So if we're self defense would be where you you maybe worked out the range at which you could um, abort your target and turn away at high G, and out and kinematically defeat the missile as long as their missile is fired from the position you're expecting it to be. So if they've moved it like even a, like a mile closer to you. It looks like it's on the same azimuth, and you fired your, you get you get the spike, you get the uh, indications of being locked up, and you think, oh yeah, it's where it, it's at. It's the brave person that's going to press on into your fire point, and uh, go, no, I can, I can, I can um, outstick him, or I can at least get my weapon away because he might just be on the same azimuth but closer to you, and and, and um, so that's the only sort of self protection you would get, as if if it was the the site that you were targeting that had fired at you, but nothing like. Um, the integration that's on the CJ. Were your were your tolerances? I mean, it might have been an arbitrary number you just gave, but one mile. But were your tolerances for threat reactions and things like that, and the self protection capability, were they really that tight? I we could do some limited modelling at our level, at squadron level, with a threat system, and um, and and work out with a. It was a generic platform rather than specifically the tornado but you could put the sort of parameters that would re were reflective of our capability into it but no i i i don't honestly recall and I, I think it would be like defense of the homeland where you were going to be starting to call the um differences in where where it's pitched up compared to where you thought it was going to be a mile okay i'm gonna i'm gonna press in and, and um because it's not like a, a an air defense fighter with a pd radar and you get you can actually see where the enemy is, where he's firing at you. There's no no lag from AWACS or anything else. It's real time information. You can see exactly where they're at. And even then, it's a bold person that decides to go right. I'm going to abort at this range, and then I'm going to see the missile just drop short of my canopy. You know, I don't think anyone's going to do that. So no, there wasn't really any kind of formal tolerance. It's a simple answer to your question. 